Hello, uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm Weva Carpenter of Design Miami, and today I'm very pleased to be speaking with Katarina Mischer and Thomas Traxler of Vienna-based design studio Mischer Traxler. Uh, this is part of the Design Miami 2021 program, which is dedicated to the theme Humankind. Uh, so our conversation today is inspired by Mischer Traxler's latest project for Perrier Jouet, uh, which explores biodiversity and the relationship between humans and other species. Uh, so maybe I'll begin our conversation by um, thinking back to the first time I saw your work, which was probably back in 2008, I think. Um, and it was an exhibition that included your Design Academy Eindhoven graduation project, The Idea of a Tree. And this was a very um, kind of lo-fi machine in a sense that extruded these uh, seating and table objects uh, using solar power. And what made the project so fascinating and eye-catching uh, was that the machine was entirely responsive to uh, the amount of sunlight available in its environment. And so it produced these objects that changed accordingly, um, much the way a tree's uh, rings, you know, are thicker or thinner in response to the sunlight that it receives. Um, so I'd love to hear more about how you developed that project, you know, over a decade ago, um, and then how your sensitivity to the natural environment has manifested in your work ever since. Yeah, I think the project you mentioned, the idea of a tree, it, uh, it started all kind of with this question, why actually when we are producing things, they all look kind of pretty much the same. Well, in nature, when uh, species are growing, they develop differently. Um, and then we based it on the example of a tree and the tree is always growing according to its surrounding influences. And so we thought it would be great to actually create the process which is also kind of sensitive to its surrounding influences. And in our case, then we decided for the sunlight because the sunlight could be on the one hand, giving the kind of energy we need for the whole process uh, mm -hmm. to, to produce the objects. And on the other hand, they were also kind of the connection because the different amount of sunlight also created a different amount of energy. And so in the end, we created, I think more a recording device where the where useful objects are the outcome but um, it showed or introduced um, the locality in the production. And we also wanted to show that it is possible also to change the rhythm of production and maybe produce in relation to a natural rhythm rather yeah. than post the natural uh, rhythm. Yeah, and it was important that the result is in, the, in fact then an individual piece rather than a, a series of similar, exactly the same objects. And so the character of each piece is really depending on the location and when and where it was made yeah and yeah so that, i mean but then you've also you went on and you've done many projects that kind of have natural forms i mean very you know literal leaves and and um uh, very natural forms and and so is there a relationship from where you started or has um your approach to sort of thinking about our relationship to the environment changed over time we think it just got more intense even. I mean, we both worked, like from 2008 onwards, we always explored natural topics more mm -hmm. because they occurred to us as being interesting rather than knowing that it's probably a very good thing to do. And as well in 2008, we started the series called Relimited that actually is a series, like a collection of various object types that all relate to numbers of, of species in Austria that are listed as endangered. So basically they are down to countable numbers, which is normally quite shocking when you look at nature and when you know mm. actually um, that, that flying insects should be there in a vast amount and suddenly somebody tells you, well, there are just 900 left maybe in whole Austria. Mm -hmm. I mean, Austria is not so big, but still having yeah. that number in mind is not that uh, incredibly big. And, and so we started turning those numbers into real pieces to talk about this decline that was yeah. already going on like 15 years ago, but it's like it didn't get better. Yeah. And so it's a series that we still continuously work on. And, and yeah, sorry, it's it's basically like limited editions, which are based on the limitation in reality, or in this case, uh, from certain species in Austria. And so yeah. from these projects, it's also always that a certain amount uh, percentage of the selling price goes, goes into an, an, an environmental fund, which is buying land to just keep as natural for as a habitat. Yeah. And so, yeah. Do so, you? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I think it's just really about us 
trying to draw attention to such topics since we are really inspired by all what is going on when you're there outside in the greenery wild. I, I don't even dare to call it nature because the park in the city is probably not the most natural place on the planet. Right. But, but still, it's like this. Once you're out there in the green and you see trees, you see insects, you see things, see things, other things that are alive. There are so many things to discover. And I think that's what we really want to draw attention to. And that's why we try to tell those stories about relationships. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, we've all um, been slow, I think, to respond to the urgency of climate change and our industry, the design industry, uh, you know, has played a huge role in the impact um, that has led to uh, climate change. Do you, when you look around today, do you see that the rest of our industry is, is waking up quickly enough? And is there something that gives you hope, uh, despite the fact that we've been a little bit slow, uh, or very slow, uh, to do what we need to do to change? I wouldn't blame design in the first place. I think I would blame our whole systems based on growth and economic growth, especially. And, and mm -hmm. that's mainly the main problem and not necessarily design and the resulting industry. I think it's industry or we think it's industry as such that really yeah. is driven by continuous growth and not necessarily individual smaller ideas. But one can, or we feel like there is change or there's this idea of change because at least it's now in discussion it's yeah. put on the table it's in some companies it's really on their agenda sadly enough politics is really slow nowadays i wouldn't even maybe not even blaming industry i mean of course they respond slower but i think politicians are the slowest at the moment in yeah. making decisions regarding the future but there is i think there is a sensibility arising in the form that people, designers, consumers, parts of industry react to the effects that we have to look at, at, at things closely and really bring a bit of transparency because mainly it's not the problem of that we all want cheaper products is once you understand why things cost a certain price and why certain things have to be considered, right. we can make deliberately choices and then decide based on other criteria. And I think that's something that is uh, slowly arising and that would, I would say gives hope. Mm. Yeah. Big yeah. No, I also, yeah. This more like kind of intangible values, which are not visible, like just with the eye, but with, mm -hmm. that you know where they are produced, how they are produced and the which conditions they are produced and also what the en environmental impact they have. And yeah. I think, this can give every con consumer also kind of a, a better idea how to make choices. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, politics will change as, you know, people's minds change and as, uh, you know, information is more available and, and people start to get the message more. So that's a nice transition into talking about your new project for Perrier Jouet. Um, can you talk a bit about how, well, first what it is um, and then, you know, how, how it aims to subvert the way humans think of themselves in relation to other species and why that sort of shift in perspective is so important right now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, the project is called uh, Embodied Nature and it is a kind of room filled installation or interactive mm. installation um, where the aim is really kind of to break up a little bit kind of this hierarchy uh, between human and nature and try to kind of put it on, on the same level, all the species and all the, all the species which are represented. And to show especially also this kind of interconnectedness that nothing can be seen, can separate from each other, but that they're all are kind of interlinked and connected to each other. So, uh, so we hope or like the visitors enter the room and um, they see kind of a huge shelf, uh, more inspired by a curiosity cabinet where in the center there's a big area which uh, makes space for projections. And um, there's also kind of a sound of different species implemented in the, in the room. But when you go there, uh, cameras actually detect you and in real time uh, animation, you actually, your, your mirror, so to say, 
um, is represented by the species which are which are all in the room. And so each person in the room is converted on screen directly into various species and on a very artistic level, because suddenly you see parts of uh, a monkey, parts of leaves, parts of flowers, and even bacteria and smaller creatures like microbacteria, uh, uh, soil organisms, algae, like organisms that maybe aren't so um, depicted that often because mm. they're tiny and they're all on the same scale level because we want to show it's all about their equal importance. It doesn't matter if they're big or small because it's about this interrelationship. And mm. um, it's basically, it's in a way very literal. It's like, okay, if you eat a carrot, the carrot is part of you. So you are connected mm. to any carrot on this planet. I mean, we don't even have a carrot in insulation, but it's this <laughs> idea, everything we we are, grow from, breathe, touch, comes from this one planet. And we cannot say we are above it because we have maybe, we have we perceive it probably maybe even if like we don't know differently. Yeah. And, and just this, we have to jump off this high, I don't know if you can if, uh, jump off this high throne of believing that we as a species are above all the others. Cause it's really like, come on, um, if, they go down, we go down, and probably we go down before them. So <laughs> in the end, we are really on the yeah, same yeah. boat. And that's why this, this the, 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 the installation tries to evoke this feeling, oh, yeah, it's not just me. It's everything I'm connected with. Yeah, and yeah. that's what yeah. we really want to evoke in every person entering that room. What I really love about it is, um, you know, for a couple of decades now, there's been very deep, serious academic philosophical writings about post-humanism and how important it is for humans to realize they're not in a hierarchy above other um, species on the planet and that that thinking has led us to uh, hurt the environment because we take our own um, sort of priorities first without thinking of the consequences on the other species. But, you know, those texts are dense and, and challenging and so, um, you know, many people probably aren't reading them. And so your installation is just such a beautiful visual translation of that eye, uh, in, in, of those ideas into something that you just get immediately, that if everything is the same size visually, the microscopic, you know, bacteria to, you know, the carrot or the elk and the human, um, you see immediately that one is not more important than the other. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research that the, the research process that you went through um, to sort of choose the species that you're representing and um, yeah, how, how it came to be? I mean, the whole project is a really a big uh, studio effort. It's not just Thomas and I, but the whole studio, like we are in total, I think it was really nine to 11 people mm -hmm. incredibly working on the project, like from the programmer to the animation people and as well within our uh, group like doing the research and and it was not fun it was fun in the point that you could pick any species and then draw attention to the one or the other and we just needed a certain rule for ourselves for not getting crazy and in the end we decided we picked um, nine um, biotopes from this planet like trying to be scattered all over the world so that somebody can relate to something because they've seen it or or heard yeah. of it so we have nine clusters and in each cluster we picked a starting species that we picked because of a very simple human reason like we have for example a potato for south america because every I, I would say most of people on this planet has have eaten and potato at one point right <laughs> and another reason was a moss for filtering air or for australia we picked corals as a natural barrier like basically a, a, a flood prevention so we picked starting species just rather random not too randomly but for a small reason why we human immediately can relate to them and then we drew a network around them by other species that interact with that specific species and then you actually find many entering points because suddenly you find out okay actually yeah, it's true we need this bacteria for that and we need this fish doing that in order to keep the system alive and then you probably understand that all these small systems belong to this big system and it's always about interrelations and correlations so that was basically how we tried to conduct the research and we as well had some dialogues with biologists to somehow back up our research strategies mm -hmm. 
And what was interesting is to see that thinking in those network structures going beyond a single species, but trying to understand how to interrelate is something that, that, that you cannot so quickly find all the information one would think you would get. But it's interesting to see how biologists really regard it as how important it is to understand these networks and that it's hard to judge if one species is more important than others. And that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and I think from the theoretical research, then it just went into kind of this practical translation into, uh, into the object which was kind of the next step. Is there anything um, sort of more, I don't know, concrete that you hope people take away from um, seeing your installation? I think on the, on the one hand, I, I think, of course, kind of more essential experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, we, we hope that by making kind of this more like, um, yeah, uh, this philo philosophical approach or kind of this uh, approach of, of breaking up this hierarchy also tangible in a way that yeah. that you are by bringing it to the to the human scale in a way that you see yourself represented as an opulent kind of accumulation of, of, of species from uh, from a certain area that afterwards maybe if you read something or if you hear something about on the one hand, biodiversity, the importance of biodiversity or something that probably people can recall kind of this emotion as well and relate to it probably a bit more personal or on a, on a, yeah, on a personal yeah. scale in a way, I think. Yeah. Well, I really look forward to seeing it. We're about um, two weeks out from the time of this recording to when um, the exhibition will open live to the public. Um, so I hope everybody uh, does take away what I have from seeing the renderings already that um, it's very moving and um, biodiversity is, is such a huge uh, topic uh, for us to approach and deal with these days. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today and um i look forward to seeing you in miami soon yeah us too. Us too. and thanks okay. for your interest and yeah, yeah. see you soon in person. <laughs>